So let me uh, introduce our uh, first keynote speaker for the day. Uh, we're really honored. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Mr. Paul Shar. Uh, Paul. <laughs> okay. There. Uh, there is Paul. Paul um, is a, a fellow at the Center for New American Security, uh, where he leads studies on the intersection of technology and uh, security, technology, and war. Uh, he has a very distinguished career uh, advising the Office of the Secretary of Defense and uh, as a key leader, thought leader, in uh, the national defense strategy in the Obama administration and uh, many of the key policy instruments that were uh, used and are still used by our government to think about this intersection of technology and, and warfare. Uh, he also, we're honored, and, and thank you for your service, sir. Uh, he was an infantryman uh, with the Army Rangers, um, did many tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, defending, as Patrick said today, our civil liberties uh, by serving uh, the nation in, in that capacity. So thank you again for that. With that, please, Paul, uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for that introduction. I'm Paul Shari from the Center for New American Security, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Um, we've got a great lineup of speakers today, a lot of really exciting stuff to dig into. I want to start the day off with something a little bit scary. Um, we're going to talk about what happens when machines are allowed to make life and death decisions in war, which is the topic of uh, my new book, Army of None, Autonomous Weapons and the Future of War. We are well into the military robotics revolution. We are now two decades in. We have seen this technology proliferate around the globe, and it continues to evolve and become more advanced. Over 90 countries have drones today, including many non-state groups that are using them for terrorist attacks around the globe. And well over a dozen nations, and growing, have armed drones. This is a map from the book, and it's already outdated because they keep proliferating so rapidly. You can see there where the main proliferator is. Over 90% of international armed drone transfers come from China. So the US doesn't control this technology. We don't have a monopoly on it. And we are not the only people who get a say in where it's going. We see with each generation of this technology, not only is it spreading around the globe, but it is evolving and becoming more advanced. And just like in automobiles, when we see more advanced autonomous features with each generation of cars, things like intelligent cruise control and automatic braking, we are seeing more advanced autonomous features in military robotics that are taking over more and more functions that humans are doing. And so the central question that the book grapples with that I want to talk about this morning is, what happens when machines are allowed to make life and death decisions in war? What happens when a Predator drone has as much autonomy as a self-driving car? I'm going to give some examples of some of the things that we're seeing militaries building around the globe to give you a flavor of what some of this technology looks like. This is an example of a totally uninhabited boat built by the US Navy. It was used in a demonstration on the James River in Virginia a few years ago. You can see there's no one at all in the boat. It's driving itself. It was used as part of a swarm demonstration of five boats working together. And this was used in a scenario for a mock strait transit, where a high value vessel would be moving through a strait. And these boats were used to intercept a potential threat. Humans said, there's a potential threat out there. Boats would go autonomously all on their own, working together to encircle a suspicious boat that's approaching. This is a very real challenge the US Navy faces from things like um, potential terrorist attacks, like the USS coal bombing, or uh, Iranian uh, small boat threats that harass US ships going through the Straits of Hormuz. And in this case, the US Navy was pretty clearly trying to send some signaling to potential adversaries. They didn't say Iran, but I'll say Iran was pretty clearly the intended target. And in one of their demonstrations, not this picture you can see here, but in one of them, they had a machine gun on this boat. And so the reporters who were being briefed on this, this is really very interesting, all of this talk about autonomy. Um, what's up with the gun? Like, who's controlling the gun? And the answer, I kid you not, was, well, 
We haven't figured that part out yet. <laughs> that was a great headline for the reporter, but it actually highlights some of the very real challenges of this technology where we are building things incrementally, step by step. And we can see that coming down the road are some very difficult choices about what we're going to delegate to these machines, what freedoms we'll allow them to have to make decisions in war. And in many cases, militaries haven't made up their minds yet. Now, it's not just the US building this technology. This is the Israeli Guardian. It's a totally uh, robotic ground vehicle, no one on board. It has been reportedly deployed along the Gaza border. And there is a version of this that is also reportedly armed. Now, Israel has said that humans will always be in control of the weapons, even though the vehicle might be driving itself. But not all countries might see it the same way. This is the Urine 9. It's a Russian ground robotic vehicle. It is much larger. Um, if, if you had people in it, you'd probably say it's like an armored personnel carrier, a fighting vehicle. It has a heavy caliber machine gun and anti-tank rockets. The rockets here actually have little extendable arms, so we could reach up the rockets and hide behind a hillside or a berm to ambush, presumably, NATO tanks. And uh, Russia deployed this last year to Syria. Saw action in Syria for a couple weeks. Russia pulled it back um, after not too long, and there were press reports that it didn't do very well because of concerns with its communication links to remote human operators. That suggests not a very high degree of autonomy if they need people to be able to remotely control it. But Russia is experimenting with things like this, sending them out to the field, learning from these kinds of deployments, and building more advanced robotic systems. They have said their plan is to make their next generation tank, the T-14 Armada, fully robotic. Not clear how far along they are in that development, but they talk very differently than the kinds of language that you hear from Western leaders. And uh, Russian senior military commanders have talked about, in the future, building fully roboticized units that are capable of independent operations. This is the X-47. It's uh, now a museum piece, but for a time was a prototype demonstration aircraft that the US Navy was building towards a future of uninhabited robotic combat aircraft. So you can see, unlike a Predator drone, um, this has the sort of sleek shape indicative of uh, a stealthy design. And this kind of aircraft, and we're seeing not just the US, but also the United Kingdom, France, uh, Russia, Israel, and China, all building prototypes of combat aircraft like this. This type of design indicates an aircraft that's intended to operate inside enemy air defense systems. Now, this is going to mean a more capable aircraft. It could do many more things for militaries. One interesting challenge is in those environments where advanced militaries are going to have radars that you need to defeat, those militaries will also likely be able to jam your communications. And that poses a very real practical challenge for using things like this. So if you build this aircraft and it costs maybe you know, $200 million, and it's operating forward in enemy air defense systems, what happens when someone jams its communications? What do you want it to do? This very simple question was what motivated the Defense Department about nine years ago to write its internal policy directive on autonomy and weapons. At the time I was working in the Pentagon, I posed this question to my boss. And I said, OK, we're building things like this. What should it do? And he kind of said what his opinion was. I said, that's great. That doesn't mean anything, because that's not written down anywhere. Um, and so eventually, the Defense Department um, worked on a policy writing its guidance on this. But there are a range of possible options that you could come up with. Um, it should come home. It could take pictures and then return back, just do surveillance missions. You could allow it to strike pre-planned fixed targets. It's basically how cruise missiles functions today. But there are a lot of targets the military cares about that are mobile and relocatable. Adversaries have learned that if you stay in one place, US Air Force is pretty good at bombing you if they can find you. And so a lot of the targets we really care about, things like mobile missile launchers in North Korea that may be tipped with nuclear weapons, are things that move and we might really want weapons that could hunt them on their own and find them and attack them. So would we be comfortable with that kind of autonomy delegated to a machine? Or what if someone fired at it? Would we allow it 
to use force and self-defense to protect itself? Now, there are no easy answers to these questions, but these are very real practical questions that militaries will have to answer in the next 15 years or so as they field weapons like this around the globe. It's not just on the air. We also have uh, ground and uh, vehicles and ships. As I mentioned earlier, this is the US Navy's Sea Hunter, a totally robotic vessel. There are obviously, you can see there are people standing on it in this photograph. Um, but it recently sailed from San Diego to Hawaii autonomously, all by itself. Now, this is designed to track enemy submarines, to do so in a much more cost-effective way than building multi-billion dollar destroyers to do so. At $20 million a pop, this is really cheap for a Navy vessel. And this poses a unique challenge that aircraft don't, which is to say it's not armed at all. It's just tracking enemy submarines. But what happens if someone were to try to undertake a hostile boarding? Would you want them to just go ahead and have access to this kind of sensitive technology? There was an incident a few years ago where China went and just took an underwater robotic drone that was operating in the South China Sea by the United States. They just went up and took it because there was no one there to stop them. And the US protested, said, give us our drone back. The Chinese said, we're very sorry. Uh, and they gave it back a few weeks later. One imagines after they'd pried it apart and looked at all the sensitive technology inside. So you might be really uncomfortable with that, with this kind of technology. So would you allow it to use lethal or non-lethal force to defend itself, to protect that kind of equipment? Again, these are real practical challenges. Now, it's not just in vehicles that we're seeing more advanced autonomy. This is the screenshot of a, uh, a graphic video for a the long-range anti-ship missile, a more advanced missile the United States is developing. And one of the things it can do that's a little bit different is a human still chooses the target, but the missile can change its route on way to the target. So in this case, you see here, there is a, a pop-up threat that comes up, represented in this red bubble. And the missile decides on its own to change its path to get to the human designated target. And it's a good example of where we see this incremental autonomy step by step, leading towards some indeterminate future. Now, I want to give an example of some of the technologies that we've had for a very long time. Because we have had lots of ways that militaries already use munitions and torpedoes and other systems with lots of autonomy. And so it's worth distinguishing where we already have today with where we might be going in the future. This is the high-speed anti-radiation missile. It's an anti-radar missile. It goes after um, radar installations. And it's been around for a long time. Militaries use things like this, uh, homing munitions, all around the globe and have had them for decades. So I want to distinguish between this type of weapon and what I'll call a fully autonomous weapon. So um, this graphic here depicts in the blue what I'll call a semi-autonomous weapon. These terms, by the way, are all debated internationally. right? Um, but the way I'm going to use them today is a semi-autonomous weapon would be one where the human chooses the target. The human says, OK, I know that there's a valid enemy target in some point in time and space. And I'm going to make a decision to attack that, and then uses some weapon with some degree of autonomy to do that. Now, the human may not have perfect real-time information about what's going on on the ground. That hasn't been true since the invention of the catapult, but would launch things over castle walls. That's not a new invention. Um, but they have enough information to say, I'm confident the enemy is here. And they launch a weapon, and the weapon has some sensor on board that allows it to maneuver to find that target. The earliest of these were homing torpedoes invented in World War II that could listen to the sound of ships' propellers, making it easier to hit moving ships. As you can imagine, it's hard to hit a ship. It's moving. Maybe you're moving. So this kind of technology made it easier for torpedoes to strike their intended target. Again, humans still choosing the target. In many cases, these are what we might call fire and forget weapons. Once you let it go, it's not coming back. Again, that's not a new invention. And more, an arrow is a fire and forget weapon. What's different in the 20th century is this crude level of intelligence on the weapon itself. And I'll distinguish between this, which is widely used around the globe today, and what I'll call fully autonomous weapons that are still built by people. They're designed by people. They're programmed by people. A human launches them. 
But the human doesn't need to know exactly where the enemy is. They can say, well, it seems reasonable to expect that the enemy might have submarines in this sea based on their battle plans or tanks moving through this valley. And they could launch a weapon that could search for targets, find them, and attack them all on their own. So this is really what has been the subject of now six years of international debate, a movement of over 60 non-governmental organizations uh, looking to ban these kinds of weapons in red, um, letters written by thousands of AI and robotic scientists uh, warning about the dangers of an AI arms race to prevent these kinds of weapons. The presumption of all of that is these weapons don't yet exist, which is like, eh, kind of true. So let's talk about some of the edge cases, because I think it helps paint a picture of where we already are today. So first of all, there are at least 30 countries that have weapons today that are human-supervised autonomous weapons that are used for defensive purposes. This is the phalanx gun um, on US Navy ships. This is the land-based version called a counter-rocket artillery and mortar system. And it's used to defend against incoming rockets or missiles where the speed of attacks might overwhelm people's ability to respond. So in a normal setting, people are still in the loop. People are making decisions about whether to fire the weapon. But at least 30 countries around the globe already have, and have had dating back to the 1980s, automatic modes that they can flip to on these defensive weapons to say, defend us automatically. And so uh, other examples include the Army's Patriot Air Defense System, the Navy's Aegis Combat System, uh, shown here, all examples of things that we have lots of experience with, actually, um, where people are in a supervisory capacity. There are some examples of fully autonomous weapons that would search for targets on their own. Less of this, but one example here is the Israeli Harpy drone. It's a kamikaze anti-radar drone. It can loiter over a wide area, hunt for enemy radars, and then attack them all on its own. One of the main differences between this and the high-speed anti-radiation missile, the HARM missile I mentioned earlier, is that missile is only active for about uh, two minutes or so. This can fly for two and a half hours. It can search for an area of several hundred kilometers. So that's a huge difference in terms of the freedom that the weapon is given to search for targets and changes the way that you might use it. Now this, again, is not a totally new um, invention. There was a, a US Navy sh uh, missile in the 1980s called the Tomahawk anti-ship missile, used to hunt Soviet ships over the horizon, but is currently um, out of service, was taken out of service in the 90s. There are also militaries advancing the boundaries of this technology in other ways, like swarming combat aircraft. I opened the book with a, an example of a swarm versus swarm aerial dogfight that the Naval Postgraduate School is doing, where they had 10 versus 10 uh, aircraft, these little styrofoam ones that they're building. Um, they're pretty cheap. They can build a lot of them, which is, which is good for their research. The most expensive thing on this is the GoPro camera on it. That's it. Um, but once in the air, all the human does is push the button to start, and then the swarm works cooperatively together to fight. And so militaries around the globe are experimenting with things like swarming technology. We're seeing more advanced autonomy in cyberspace as well. This is a graphic showing the spread of one variant of Stuxnet across the internet. And defensive cyber systems. This is uh, the winning computer in DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge a few years ago called Mayhem, which does autonomous cyber reasoning, searching computer code for cyber vulnerabilities, and then either offensively exploiting them or defensively patching them. Same technology, totally dual use has been pitted against human hackers, and he's not better than the best human hackers in the world, but it's in the top 20 or so, so pretty good, and good enough to be relevant and useful in a variety of settings. So I want to very, very briefly cover legal and ethical um, and strategic issues that come up in this. Each of these is a whole chapter in the book, so I'm going to have to uh, be very concise here. But one of the first things that come up is, what about the laws of war? And what do they have to say about this? The answer is not very much. There's nothing in the laws of war that says anything about autonomous weapons. Now, there are two ways to view this. One way is to say that um, that's because the laws of war 
focus on a set of principles about militaries' conduct in war. There are rules like distinction. Militaries have to only target intentionally the enemy, not civilians. Or the rule of proportionality, where a military attack can't have more collateral damage than it would be proportional to the military necessity of the target being attacked. And so if autonomous weapons could do better than humans, then we would have an ob a legal obligation to use them, actually, to save civilian lives. Just like how eventually self-driving cars were able to save lives on roadways and do better than humans. Another perspective is that um, there's nothing in the laws of war because it's always been implicit that humans would make these decisions. And we should write it down now because there is some value that humans have in making these that machines don't. What that is is perhaps a little fuzzy right now, particularly as the technology keeps evolving over time. One important asymmetry uh, that does exist is that um, humans are legal agents and machines are not. So under the laws of war, humans are responsible for complying with the laws of war, where machines are simply tools in the hands of individuals. But it raises difficult questions about what that means, how we apply that in a practical matter to rules about what to do. There are important uh, moral and ethical issues that come up at well that might be outside uh, the laws of war. There was um, uh, an incident I talk about in the book where as, um, uh, when I was on an army ranger sniper team uh, in Afghanistan early in the war, I was in a, a hide site and we were discovered and approached by a, a small little girl who came to scout out our position. She was about five or six. She came with a couple goats in tow and she was scouting for the enemy and run reporting back on us and what we were doing. And after she left, not so long after, some, some Taliban fighters came and, and attacked us. And we talked about later how we would handle a situation like that one. Something that never came up in our discussions was the idea of shooting this little girl. Nobody suggested that. What's interesting is under the laws of war, that would have been legal. Because by scouting for the enemy, she was participating in hostilities. The laws of war don't set an age for combatants. So she was a valid enemy combatant, just the same as if she had been a 19-year-old man doing the same thing, scouting for the enemy. So if you built a robot to perfectly comply with the laws of war, it would have killed this little girl which I think in that situation would have been wrong. There are many choices in war that, um, where there are sometimes no, no good answer at all. I don't think this was one of them. I think it was pretty clear cut. And so did my teammates. Again, nobody had suggested that. But how would you design a, ro a robot to know the difference between what's legal and what's right? And how would you program in these rules that are based on uh, values of our society and respect for human life? And how do you ensure that kind of compliance? And one last consideration that often comes up is issues of whether these weapons are destabilizing to international peace and security. So what does a world look like where we have advanced autonomous systems operating at machine speed with opaque algorithms that we heard about earlier? People aren't going to share with their competitors how they might function. But we have examples of this. We've seen it in stock trading. And we've seen examples like flash crashes where um, Interactions between algorithms or people deliberately manipulating algorithms lead to massive changes in price in short periods of time. And what's really interesting is how people have dealt with this problem. They actually haven't solved it. Um, if you've heard about this less, it's because what they've done is they've installed circuit breakers that take stocks offline if the price moves too quickly in one direction or the other. And so the mini flash crashes actually still occur. There was an incident a few years ago where over 1,000 circuit breakers were tripped across multiple markets in a single day. But there's no referee to call time out in war. So if we're going to manage this kind of phenomenon in war of unexpected interactions at high speed and mitigate the risk of a flash war, we're going to have to do it ourselves or working with our competitors, which is very challenging. As I mentioned, there have been discussions going on internationally for six years now, it's great that countries are coming together. But to be honest, the pace of diplomacy is moving much, much slower than the pace of technology here. And I want to close with a quote from General Paul Seville, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, 
the uh, number two military commander in the United States, seen here in the background, in the uh, foreground here, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, who we'll hear from later today, who's been a major champion of AI and robotics um, for the Defense Department. And here, General Silva um, says, I think we should all be advocates for keeping the ethical rules of war in place, lest we unleash on humanity a set of robots we don't know how to control. Which I want to include this because he talks about interesting things that are like ethics, control, humanity. It's a very noble sentiment. It seems reasonable. But how do you put this into practice? How do you tell an engineer, do this? Right? You could build more advanced autonomy, but this is your rule set. And that is ultimately the challenge we face, is to find ways to use this technology to not only defend the nation, but also potentially make warfare more precise and more humane, but without losing our humanity in the process. Thanks very much. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, fantastic uh, remarks. And I, I have to tell you that um, you know it was a, a review in The Economist of your book when it came out that President Daniels read and uh, wrote to me and a few others and said, wow, this is a really interesting, fascinating book. Uh, why don't we think about uh, inviting the author and having a symposium around this topic? Okay. So that's how it all emerged. That's why we're all here. So again, thank you. And thank you for your book. It really is a fascinating book. Uh, Paul uh, will kindly be signing uh, copies of the book at lunchtime if you're interested. We have a, a, a set of books uh, there, and, and uh, you're more than welcome to come up and uh, grab a book and have it signed by Paul. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, any questions uh, from the audience, uh, please, uh, on, on these fascinating topics? Yes. Back there. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. Oops. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Paula Trimble, um, since we're here at a university, my question is, given all that we've just discussed, what do you think the role of academia is in working and sorting through these problems? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. I mean, one, I think this is fundamentally a really interdisciplinary challenge. Because to grapple with this, you have to bring together people who understand the technology, the law, the ethics, um, international relations and security. So it's one that um, I think universities can bring a lot of value to and by bringing together experts in computer science and legal experts and ethical ones. And, and universities can be a great place to have these conversations, not just with the right experts in the room, but particularly set aside from the politics of the issue. So countries have been coming together at the UN to talk about this, but it's super political. So countries come and they have their sort of talking points and they're defending their political equities, all, all nations. And their positions have a lot to do with whether they see this technology is going to advantage them or not. Um, and they're not always as focused on just like what is the right answer. And so I think that's a great role that academia can play. Thanks. Any other? Let's see, back there. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much. Perhaps a little closer to home, uh, Boston Robotics and, and Atlas. Have you kind of investigated that? Could you talk to that a little bit? This is the Army's Atlas program, the tank? Yes, sir. OK, so if folks aren't, aren't familiar with this, um, the Army released publicly um, a program a few um, weeks ago, well, maybe, maybe a month or two ago now, earlier this spring, um, called Atlas, that was some algorithm for automated targeting. The L was for lethality, if I recall. Um, and that got people's attention, because if you put automated and lethality together, you know, people sort of wake up a little bit. And um, basically, it was a system that would be, be plugged onto a tank or fighting vehicle and allow sensors to automatically detect the environment and then cue information to human operators. Um, the way that it was written was a little bit clumsy, in, in my mind, um, resulted in some media controversy, some concern about where the Army was going. The Army later clarified their view that they were going to operate consistent with um, Defense Department policy, um, talking to, to folks directly about this in the Army. Uh, what I've heard from them is their intentions are to keep people in the loop on this, to keep humans involved in these decisions. Um, but it goes to both um, anxiety about where this is going, I think some, some open questions, um, some concern from, from some quarters that 
without some kind of legal framework in place that you know, we don't have enough bulwark in place to prevent um, a movement towards full autonomy in the future. But also some of the challenging language on this issue. The Defense Department recently has become enamored with the word lethality um, because of the former uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Jim Mattis. One of the things that happens in the Defense Department is these sort of intellectual fads that come and go. Uh, Network-centric warfare, RMA, um, you know, building partnership capacity, uh, irregular warfare. And whenever these things happen, what happens is people just sort of take what they're doing and then they label it with the bumper sticker du jour. And everyone's really effective in this. Um, when, um, um, <laughs> when, Deputy, when Deputy Secretary of Work was, was in the department and championed the third offset strategy, all of a sudden everything people were doing became third offset. I'm like, mm, not all of it was, right? And so that's a continual challenge. Um, and so, so right now you see a lot of this buzz of lethality, which I think exacerbates some of these, some of these issues in the sort of what the narrative is, the discussion about the technology. Thanks. Um, other questions? Uh, yes. Um, so Rod Miller, um, what do you think the role is Rod, of uh, the Rod. arms control community in terms of uh, using uh, focusing on AI and its use in warfare? Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing that the arms control community can do is bring to bear a set of intellectual tools for thinking about dangerous technologies, um, how we understand risks associated with them, and how we mitigate those risks in thoughtful ways, and apply that to these new technologies. I mean, this is only one tiny facet of AI in warfare, um, which is much, much bigger than autonomous weapons. Um, it happens to be a a one that, that captures people's attention, right? Um, robots deciding whom to kill seems like a you know, kind of a scary thing. But, but there's, I think, a place where the arms control community can really help people think through some of these challenges and what potential solutions are that's not necessarily happening in these conversations. There's a very robust human rights community that's engaged in these discussions, but they're coming really from a position of advocacy, not analysis. Um, and I think that the conversations will be better if people come at some sort of understanding the problem first and then trying to figure out what the solutions are. Yes. Yeah. John, uh, John Hopkins um, had some questions. Can you uh, please oh, yeah. kind of bring your microphone there? So. so out of John Hopkins came some excellent work in the 1990s um, surrounding kill vehicles and looking at what we called the engagement chain back then and how the nature of questions um, changes as you approach a target and as your opportunities change, right? right. So a lot of this work I influenced my work also. So um, and it, it, it born out of you know looking at max, you know entropy type of problems. So um, we've got several problems like lensing through uh, disrupted uh, <laughs> disrupted uh, environment, you know, uh, um, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. you know, there's problems that we can work on in a purely physical way um, that we can, you know, find the anxiety with or the, uh, the contradictions simply in the math and the physics and try and work out some of these issues there. What is your feeling on that? Is that, you know, is, is you're saying that, you know, there's the, the ethics and the emotional aspect of these things, but we can also work in a more really strictly physical type of problem. So, I mean, because yeah. our imaging problems, for instance, when people start throwing bombs and having explosions and firestorms are happening in urban situations, these are really difficult lensing problems, right, right? That we would be asking these weapons to figure out on the fly. Yeah, I mean, the exciting thing about where the technology is, is that it's moving so quickly and we've really just started to scratch the surface of what machine learning can do what kinds of problems that can be applied to, um, as well as continued advances in sensing and optics and, and computing power and other areas, um, that there's a lot of potential to use some of these technologies to solve many of the problems that have long been an issue for militaries and for researchers. Um, when I look at this and think about, okay, where do we use automation, where it might be good at, where would it maybe not be good at, I tend to differentiate between things where we, have, we know that there is a right answer. We know what better performance looks like. If we're trying to correctly ID a target, um, that's a place where we know what better performance is. Right? It's either uh, a MIG or it's not. This person is either holding a rifle or they're not holding a rifle. 
There's an objectively right answer. We may not know the answer, but there is a right answer. And those are things where I think machines can do better over time. Um, some of those problems are going to be harder than others, but those are great places to focus our attention. There are other problems that don't have right answers. In warfare, um, how much collateral damage is proportional to a military target? Laws of war don't say. That might depend upon human judgment. There are other decisions in war that might very much depend upon what we think of as judgment, where very reasonable people may come up with different answers to those questions. Those are very hard to envision the machines that we have today being able to solve those kinds of problems. Um, so that's how I would sort of break down where I think we could use automation to do a lot of great things and places where we probably want to keep humans in charge of decisions that involve judgment for at least the foreseeable future. Okay, okay one last question over there. Yeah, thank you. Um, when you're down range, like you were talking about yourself in Afghanistan, and we're looking at um, those types of uh, AI that are not human driven, but working down range, what, co what, what comes first? You know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking when you, when you have to make the discretionary call you had to make, uh, a Russian or a Chinese soldier may not make the same discretionary call, right? So is it ethics coming first or is law coming first because the technology is moving so fast? And is there something currently in place? that they're looking at it to say, okay, let's write statute first based on ethics, because not everyone's ethical belief is gonna be the same, yet the technology's in the hands with a number of people. Do you understand that question? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so one fundamental challenge here is compliance with the laws of war is, needless to say, very uneven across the international community, right? Um, you know, by and large, if you focus on better legal compliance, that'll get you like 99% of the way there. Um, I think there are, there are outside cases. There are cases where the laws don't give good examples or good answers to, to situations like the, the example I gave. Um, and those are places where I do think there's value in having humans making these kinds of decisions. Um, but uh, if we can just do a better job overall in the US and other militaries of legal compliance, um, that would make war much more humane than it already is. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.